Welcome to the lecture. I'm Cynthia McAllister. In this lecture, you will learn about the Learning Conference format, including its primary aim and procedures. This lecture also includes a full description of the Learning Conference and an explanation of the logic it's based on. Learning conferences are 10-minute meetings with individual students intend to engage them in conversations about their learning. They take place during work time, before, after, or between work group sessions. Learning conferences are opportunities for you to meet on a one-on-one -on -one basis with students. Depending on the target numbers that your school leadership determines based on the total number of instructional days in the year, the average number of conferences for each student should take place on a set basis. This guideline is an aspect of the opportunity to learn strategy inherent in the learning cultures model. It's based on an access logic. If we know that certain types of social interactions promote learning, then accountability for us to ensure that every child has consistent access to these interactions is a means by which opportunity to learn can be guaranteed to each child. You should post a conference schedule in your classroom so that every student knows when they will be having a conference and so that they can prepare for the conference. Through a process of breaking down and resolving challenges and generalizing and applying new insights to other situations, the student is assisted in developing key executive functions that have a role in creative thinking, cognitive flexibility, planning, and problem solving. Practice in these ways of thinking helps students gain a self-theory about their own intelligence that is growth-oriented. So, summary procedures. First, the teacher creates a master conference calendar in advance. This calendar, as I said, is posted in the classroom so students know when their conference will occur and so that they can be prepared. The teacher, at the time of the conference, moves to the location where the student is working to conduct the conference. This is so that the conference can happen in the context of work in real time. The student is prepared with curriculum materials that present an opportunity to engage in a specific conceptual challenge. Overly general challenges are not appropriate for the conference, such as didn't do homework, isn't prepared. In this case, the teacher navigates the conference to focus on a specific conceptual challenge or reschedules the conference. In this case, the teacher indicates in notes that the child was unprepared. The fact they were unprepared is discussed. This meeting does not count as a conference and the conference must be rescheduled. Fourth, the teacher invites the student to engage with the material and to identify points of confusion. Teachers should refrain from directing the conference. It's important that the student articulates the cognitive moves that they're making, talking both about the challenges and also about the things that they understand. Number five, the student articulates the challenge using precise terms. The teacher can follow into a student comment to help provide terminology if necessary. Number six, the student articulates existing conceptual understandings that can serve as a foundation for resolving the confusion. Again, the teacher can follow into student comments to help provide terminology if necessary. Number seven, the student attempts to resolve the challenge by relating what is known about the concept to what is still not understood. Number eight, the teacher follows into student comments to guide understanding if necessary. Number 10, once the challenge is resolved, the student recites in a linear narrative the process of solving the challenge. Number 10, the student articulates essentially what's the moral of the story or the conference takeaway and applies it to a statement of learning in the form of a goal that can be transferred and applied to other situations. This is a lot to think about at once, so we're going to unpack the procedures that I've just described. But first, here are some important pointers. The learning conference is conducted at a table at a location where the student is working in the context of a work time situation. That is, you should move to the child for the conference rather than having them come to you. So much of our thinking, and therefore so much of our learning, is context or situation dependent. 
it's the relationship between the student and the situation that you're going to be relying on in the conference in order to help them develop their understanding. So moving to them in the context of their work is critical. When appropriate, prompt the student to reference the group experience of cooperative unison reading to consider possible alternative ways of thinking about or resolving a challenge. The learning conference is a structure that guides students in independent thinking, but their thinking about most complex ideas are preceded by encounters with versions of these ideas in the social world. Referencing the group process helps the child use their imagination of intermental deliberations to expand possibilities for intramental problem solving. In other words, this process helps the child move from the social way of understanding an issue to an independent way of trying to understand the same issue. Use the conference record to document your insights. The conference form prompts you to allow the child to make full utterances. Remember, their talk is a form of action, and it's important for you to involve the child in opportunities to fully articulate their ideas so that their ideas take the form of action. The learning conference rubric should be used to guide the implementation of the learning conferences. It should also be used as an instructional tool to help students understand conference procedures and the overall purpose. And it can be used as a professional development tool so that teachers can refine their practice. Principals can use the tool for teacher evaluation and observation. The materials you'll need for the conference are the learning conference record, the curriculum materials that are brought by the student representing work currently being done and featuring a conceptual challenge, and the learning conference rubric. So let's now dig a little more deeply into the learning conference and some of the ideas that explain its logic. The learning conference is probably the most challenging and least well understood of all the learning cultures formats, probably because it aims to achieve a way of thinking in students that most of us have never experienced as the focus of formal instruction. The learning conference is designed to teach and do executive functions in the context of curriculum embedded challenges. Executive functions are required for the kind of higher order thinking that's so critical to school success. The EFs, as they're also called for short, are concerned with one's ability to assert control over cognitive processes. You can think of them as the responsibilities of the organization of your brain. Executive functions include working memory or the ability to keep your attention focused on something while you work on thinking about it. Reasoning. Task flexibility or the ability to cognitively move flexibly between ideas and situations. Problem solving. Planning and execution and inhibitory control, or the ability to selectively attend to a thing. Let's explore for a minute the construct of executive functions and how they apply to the conference situation. We'll revisit the conference process and work our way through the process in order to understand how executive functions come to life. The learning conference procedure is simple, but the insights it promotes are complex. This is what you need to be concerned with. Begin a dialogue with a student in one of two ways. A quick reference to the notes from the previous conference will initiate a conversation about whether the student feels he or she has made strides toward meeting goals that you've previously set. This reflective component is a way to help the student realize the effectiveness of approaching academic work through some of the ways they're learning to think about their own thinking. Next, guide the student to identify a challenge they're presently encountering in their work. They shouldn't just talk about it or summarize it, but get into the form of action in doing the work that brings the challenge to life. You need to prompt them to talk about their thinking as they proceed through the challenge. They need to name the elements of the challenge that they both understand and those that they're confused by. If they struggle to find terms to describe these elements, you can follow in and provide terminology to facilitate the process but don't take over. Many teachers are inclined to use the conference in a more familiar teacher-directed way by teaching content and concepts. 
by showing, demonstrating, or telling. Don't do this. This is not the purpose of the conference. The learning conference exists to help students learn to put their challenges under a microscope, to examine them, think logically and strategically about them, recast them in new novel ways of understanding, and use higher and better understandings to improve upon the original way they approach the problem. The conference teaches kids to work their memory in order to think creatively, to think in novel ways, to plan and solve problems. I want to give you a few metaphors so that you can think about the primary aim of the conference in new ways yourself. Number one, you're inviting the student to open a Pandora's box, letting out all the demons so that they can be slayed one by one. You're opening a can of worms, helping the child disentangle them and set them free. You're getting the child into quicksand and helping them learn how to use their own strength to pull themselves to safety. You're getting them lost in the woods and forcing them to get their bearings and strategize a way to get to a clearing. Finally, you're forcing them to make the familiar strange and to make the strange familiar, to put their challenge at a distance so that they can analyze it and gain control over it. Adele Diamond, the developmental cognitive neuroscientist, explains executive functions in this way, and I'll quote, it's inhibitory control. To stay on task when you're bored or when you meet initial failure, you need an inhibitory control to focus in on something in the environment so that you're not overwhelmed by all the other things around. Another aspect of executive functions is working memory. It's holding information in your mind and playing with it. You need working memory for anything that unfolds over time. You also need working memory for creativity because the essence of creativity is holding things in mind and disassembling them and putting them together in new ways. You need working memory. The last executive function is cognitive flexibility. It's being able to switch your perspective or switching the way you're thinking about things. Being able to think outside the box. Of course, it's also an aspect of creativity. Those are the basic aspects of executive functions. Out of that, more sophisticated executive functions like planning and problem solving get built up." End quote. As the student is working through a challenge, encourage them to make their thinking transparent by writing words, symbols, or diagrams on a whiteboard or a page of their notebook. The aim of the conference is to provide an opportunity for them to achieve their own aha moment. So bite your tongue when you feel the impulse to tell or teach. The conference is only successful if the student makes the cognitive moves to achieve a higher level of understanding, not if you do it for them. Once the student has achieved success, solved a challenge creatively, or achieved a new and improved way of solving a problem, get them to recount their steps through a narrative retelling. I suggest relying on the good old familiar story structure and teach kids to think about the conference in these terms. Essentially, it's a once upon a time story. Once upon a time I was confused and frustrated by so and so. So I did X, but I realized Y. So then I did A and realized B. So then I tried this and discovered that. And on and on. Finally, I triumphed. I solved the problem, got smarter, achieved success. The thing I learned from the experience, essentially the moral of the story, is that, and then they explain the moral of the story. So from now on, when I encounter this kind of challenge again, I'm going to do such and such. The last part, generalizing a new insight to think about how it applies to novel and future situations, takes the form in the conference format of goal setting. All conferences should establish a concrete goal that the child will endeavor to apply before the next conference. Prompt the student to tell you the goal in their own words. Help them make it into the form of a promise or a commitment. Research shows that people are more inclined to successfully achieve goals or change their behaviors when they have publicly promised to do so. So the goal can be written by you, but should be in the student's words. Then have the student sign or initial the promise. Again, this symbolic gesture has a real benefit. 
there's another logic that supports the learning conference. Our self-perceptions about our competencies and performances have a large role in determining our attitudes towards these things. The more we perceive ourselves as competent, and the more we perceive others in seeing us as competent, the more effort we invest in preserving and improving our competence. If we see ourselves as incompetent, not only do we invest less effort in a task, we usually invest quite a lot of effort in avoiding the task. The social psychologist Joshua Aronson coined the term mindset to describe the mental stance a person takes in relation to their sense of self-competence in a given situation. He and his colleagues found that the perceptions a person has about lingering stereotypes in the environment, for example, that girls are dumb in math, undermine their performance in significant ways. What's significant about his work is that he also found that mindsets can be shifted or changed through interventions. The psychologist, Carol Dweck, applied the term mindset to her research on self-theories of intelligence. She explained that individuals typically fall on a continuum when it comes to the mindsets of their own intelligence. On one end, people believe intelligence or ability are innate or fixed. They believe that effort has little bearing on challenging the outcome of situations that test ability because, their reasoning goes, regardless of their investment, destiny is predetermined by traits that are fixed. On the other end of the spectrum are those with growth mindsets. They believe that hard work, effort to learn, and training determine success. People with growth mindsets naturally have a stronger sense of personal agency and responsibility in learning. Carol Dweck explains, and I quote, In a fixed mindset, students believe their basic abilities, their intelligence, their talents are just fixed traits. They have a certain amount, and that's that. And then their goal becomes to look smart all the time and never look dumb. In a growth mindset, students understand that their talents and abilities can be developed through effort, good teaching, and persistence. They don't necessarily think everyone's the same or anyone can be Einstein, but they believe everyone can get smarter if they work at it." End quote. The more we can help students understand that they have agency and can control their destiny as learners, the more successful they will be in school. The more they know exactly what things they can do to improve their competencies, the more targeted their efforts at improvement can become. And the more clearly they understand their competencies, the more motivated and self-determined they will become. Explicit competence feedback is key to building a student's sense of self-competence and to helping them strategically apply their effort. With these insights in mind, the Learning Conference is organized around helping students dissect and overcome specific challenges in their conceptual learning. Here's a note of caution before we conclude. The typical danger in conducting the conference is to focus on general dispositions and attitudes, such as be more engaged, be more organized, come to class prepared, etc. This type of general feedback is not effective, and this kind of conference should be viewed as ineffective. Students need to know exactly what they need to do to have an impact in any given situation. So let's summarize and review. In this lecture, you learned about the Learning Conference. You learned about the primary aim and basic procedures of the Learning Conference. The logic behind the Learning Conference was also explained. Without referring back to the lecture, see if you can explain the logic of the Learning Conference. Why are Learning Conferences conducted? What insights in students are they intended to develop? How do they help students achieve and become more successful? And here's a last note on professional development. Because helping students to identify and overcome specific ways of thinking and acting that present challenges to learning, getting better at learning conferences is a powerful path towards a teacher's professional development. The more effectively you can cut to the chase in a situation to help a student take initiative to hone in on a barrier to their success, the more you will improve as a teacher. Because of its huge impact on learning, the Learning Conference is considered a high-impact format 
and should be the focus of school-wide professional development on an ongoing basis. Every teacher should consistently take advantage of opportunities to observe colleagues who are proficient in the learning conference, engage in self-reflection of their own conference competence, set goals for improvement, and repeat the cycle on an ongoing basis.